go to the Einstein field equations to try to solve them in an approximate way. And okay, let me show you um, a bit the difficulty. So this was actually produced by a math notebook. Um, if you ask it to output what is this Einstein tensor actually in terms of the metric, you see this horrible, like, not even all the terms could be shown here. It's a horrible differential equation. You have to remember the metric is 10 variables. Each of these derivatives is, has four components, so it's a horrible, horrible mess. And um, as I said, um, one has to be careful what gauge to choose because if one chooses the wrong gauge, were wrong in quotation marks, one can end up with a mathematically unsolvable problem. Because if the structure of these second derivatives becomes um, yeah, mathematically not very nice, then you cannot solve it. But there is a class of gauges that is known and has been known since the 1960s, I believe, to um, work very well. Um, but there are also, of course, others. But for, for harmonic gauge, um, which is given by where the contracted Christoffel symbols vanish, then um, these equations simplify. And the principal part actually is the curved space-time inversion operator. And that can be shown to be well posed. It was shown by Yvon choquet bruyard who I saw on the poster outside, um, also listed already um, many decades ago. So this is the gauge we will also work in. So one, one question um, yeah. about this uh, gauge choice. Yeah. So you say if you choose a bad gauge, yeah. uh, then you got, you have something that cannot be solved. Is it formally uh, unsolvable or it's just very, very complicated? No, it's from mathematically, um, it's called an, an ill-posed mathematical problem. So yeah, it, you can show that it cannot be, it's, it doesn't have a physical solution as a um, Cauchy problem. So as if you put an initial value, then um, you cannot solve for the time evolution in a physically realistic way. So, yeah. so in this uh, harmonic gauge, that, so if you choose this gauge, it still have some uh, remaining gauge for it and to simplify this. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, very good. We will come back to this a bit later on. Yes. Very good point. Um, yes, okay. So um, this gauge is, is kind of to motivate mm -hmm. the gauge we will be using. And so now we want to apply it to the basics of post Newtonian um, or PN theory, which is kind of a framework that includes different approximations. So it also includes some post Minkowski approximations. All of this is kind of also called post Newtonian theory. And um, there are many uh, different approaches to um, compute post expansions, including Feynman diagrams, which I will not cover, um, because I want to cover the aspect that has been kind of used to produce the state-of-the-art waveforms that have also um, co computed the radiation to 4pn order. So, um, but even for that, there are different formulations. Nevertheless, for these lectures, we will use the so-called Landau-Lifshitz formulation. Of these Einstein field equations. So EFE means Einstein field equations. Um, and the variable one works with is um, so we, one introduces a, a um, decomposition of the metric. So we take minus the determinant of the metric and then this inverse metric. That's, that's kind of important because this is a tensor density. It's not um, the full tensor. So the if you lower the indices, this that G factor will vary. Um, so we call this eta mu nu plus H mu. And here, eta is the Minkowski metric, and h is the remaining part that is not the Minkowski metric. And this is an exact decomposition at this stage. It's just rewriting um, what this quantity is. And one then plugs it into the Einstein field equations, 
we will not go through all the algebra here. It's going to take a lot of work because one also has to convert derivatives of the metric now to this quantity and so on. In the end, one obtains a nice result. which is given by um, box of H alpha beta equal to 16 pi to the four, how alpha beta. So this has a very nice form here. This box is just the flat space Dalembertian. So it's eta d mu d mu. Um, this tau, is a um, combination of the matter source plus field nonlinearities, which I denote by eta alpha beta, uh, n alpha beta, which depend on H, derivatives of H, and even second derivative of H. So this form is a bit deceptive. Um, so here are second derivatives of H, but here there are also second derivatives of H, but they appear with nonlinear combinations of H itself. So um, this tau alpha beta is also sometimes called the energy momentum pseudo tensor. And um, yeah, let me also write down here, matter and field nonlinearities. And um, together with this, we also need the harmonic gauge condition, which can be shown to be equivalent to just the divergence of this H being zero. Hmm. So d mu h mu equals zero. And because um, this partial derivative commutes with this um, wave um, operator, we can also see that it implies that um, the divergence of this tau also has to be zero. OK. Um, and now, um, it is only these two conditions together that are equivalent to the original Einstein equations. And um, can, I, here, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so the harmonic gauge there, yeah. uh, it's given in terms of um, the Christoffel symbol and the, and the metric. Yeah. This is a linearized version of that? No, it's still exact. So you can show once you convert what these Christoffel symbols are in terms of um, this quantity, so this is also sometimes called the Gothic metric. I see, see it in, I cannot write Gothics, yes. but something like this. <laughs> 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 I, I, I mean, it, it's not Gothic inverse metric density. Um, once you convert it in terms of this and substitute eta plus h for it, then you find it's equivalent to requiring this. So it's still exact at this stage. So um, also here, this condition then determines the mo motion of matter. Um, and this is important or not yeah, interesting to know because sometimes, um, well, because it turns out you can solve these equations without requiring the harmonic gauge condition to hold. And then it's called the relaxed um, field equations. And it, so you, you, you can solve this system for some generic um, matter configuration, but then at the end of the calculation impose that the matter has to obey these conditions. And then um, it kind of projects down to the physical solution that is a solution to the inside field equations. But so sometimes this is, you see it referred to as the relaxed inside field equations. It's similar to doing calculations, maybe off shell and then um, going on shell or something like this. Just yeah, because in in some textbooks, um, 
I think they are referred to as the relaxed field equations. Okay, so, so far, as I mentioned, this is an exact decomposition, but um, because here on the right-hand side, there are also second derivatives of H, it's not so useful. I mean, it's we know how to invert this operator, but then we get a kind of, in if we um, write down a solution in terms of an integral over this tau, then we haven't really solved the problem. We've just converted one problem to a different one. But of course, this is highly useful when h is small so that you can kind of in a leading approximation neglect this term solve, then in the next iteration solve. And this is exactly the um, condition we need to apply it uh, to binary systems at large separations. So if we... Sorry, can I... Does this formula uh, is coming, uh, is it known for, for general? This tau? It's, it's a capital N. Capital N? Um, yes. Uh, already so know it. General? Well, it's it's difficult to output it um, explicitly. So um, you can, it's, uh, so if you keep the Gothic and don't do this decomposition, then um, you can output kind of the equivalent of this N. It um, looks, I can show you later of a mathematical mm -hmm. notebook. But, but then once you substitute this decomposition, then this N becomes, yeah, really not not nice and you, but perturbatively you can approximate but in principle it is known exactly let's say um so now we consider this in spiraling binary source and um we start by um, looking a bit more at properties of this source. Um, two masses, N1 and N2, which we now, for this lecture, treat as point masses. Um, and so we assume they are in the early in spiral, so they are far apart. Um, so, um, Let's say one of their, their properties is it's a gravitationally bound source, which means there is kind of um, this relation between the gravitational potent interaction potentials and the velocities of the system. And this we assume to be small. Uh, no, this not yet, that's a separate assumption. So here, just um, gravitationally bound, we have this kind of relation. And then we assu assume also it is semi-relativistic, which means we assume this is small. V over C is small, which by assumption implies also this is small. And these are the post-Newtonian assumptions. Okay, and so what is um, what you see from these scalings here is that both of these involve factors of C. So um, we, while these are relevant dimensionless parameters of the system, so mathematically, if you write down a perturbative expansion, you should use some dimensionless small parameter. But um, in practice, it turns out you can do the post-Newtonian expansion by treating one over C as kind of a formal parameter, small parameter. So it's common to use one over C as a small parameter. This is also what we will do here. Um, and then each factor of one over C is one post Newtonian order, or one half post Newtonian order. Just to, to clarify what the counting means. Hmm. 
Is the first assumption that we are making true also for very eccentric bound orbits or for a reasonably quasi-circular only for like quasi-circular ones? Um, it should be valid for bound systems throughout, even if they yeah, are from the the, the, yeah, the the virial. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if it's true somehow on average over a trajectory or really point by point of a trajectory. I never remember. That's why I'm asking. So maybe there are some points for an elliptic trajectory where it's not strict to speak. Well, it depends what you put as the R. If you put the very center, then this is true. But for the upper center? Well, not then not. Ah, okay. So then it's strictly speaking only true for reasonably not so eccentric somehow. Yes. So in principle, yeah. I mean, you you can make an approximation. But then how well it works for a specific case is questionable. Yeah. So is the post-Newtonian a, a good description of a highly eccentric system? Not as good, because the highly eccentric goes quite more in the strong field. Um, so for circular, as um, Wojtek said, um, is yeah, a better description, because there the velocities are generally smaller. But again, the eccentric system depends on what kind of eccentric system, how small is the pericenter, and so on. So in principle, um, this post setup works for any system, but for a given eccentric system compared to the same, um, uh, let's say, semilatus rectum as a circular system, then it's um, worse for the eccentric system. More questions? Okay, so why did we now um, make all of these um, considerations? Well, because now we want to know how we should approximate this H milieu that we need to solve for from the Einstein field. So we consider then um, the source strings. So um, we say the stress energy tensor is well at leading order if you think of the Newtonian limit. Um, so let's say Newtonian limit, it roughly scales at least the zero zero component um, scales. Well, that's it. I don't know how to write it very well, but okay. Um, the, the term in the Newtonian limit, let's say, is rho c, right? It's the rest mass density times c squared if you approximate the energy momentum tensor. The point is, um, and rho is the density, the point is that this energy momentum tensor, it starts at order c squared. This is kind of what, um, what we want to use. OK, then we can say, um, well, you right here. So T alpha beta is order C squared plus corrections. And um, then we know we have this Einstein field equations, box H alpha beta is 16 pi G over um, C to the fourth. And then we have minus G. Now we have C squared um, or order C squared that's these nonlinear terms. So it indicates um, that if we, we cancel out these factors of C, that the H should start at order one over C squared. So at first one post Newtonian order. So then this kind of motivates that we start with an ansatz H alpha beta is one over C squared, H one alpha beta, because the zero term is just the eta that we had before in the answers, um, plus order one over c cubed. And um, 
yeah, so one remark with because of the limited time we have. So usually this needs to be done in a three plus one decomposition because different components of this H will scale differently. And also the zero zero component is a scalar, zero I is a vector and IJ is a tensor and so on. So in principle, um, so it should be a three, three plus one. composition and treat components separately, but we will just sweep that under the rug um, for here, here. Okay. All right. So uh, now that we have established that H should, should start at order one over C squared, we can then determine the other um, parts of the, that appear in the Einstein field equations. Um, namely, the determinant of the metric is then just the one of eta plus corrections. Um, and the nonlinearities come in at higher order than one over c squared. Um, so <coughs> we have that um, minus g is one plus order one over c squared. And this n alpha beta is of order one over c to the four because it was supposed to be nonlinear terms in H, and if H is order one over c squared, it should be one over c to the four. So then, um, at the leading order, um, or at least substituting this in the Einstein field equations, then. Um, leads to a system of equations and a system of equations order by order in C. They, they take the form box H1, 16 pi G, now just taking the one over C squared component, which was just from the energy momentum tensor. Um, and yeah, let's let's say we still keep this here as alpha beta um, one. And then the next order terms will be something like um, the nth order will be 16 pi G and then uh, yeah, let, let's let's just say lambda alpha beta, which depends on h n minus one, all the way up to h. And here, this lambda is basically saying you should now perform the post Newtonian expansion of this tau alpha beta, so the n expansion. Oh, alpha beta, which you know, then you have to calculate the metric determinant, the nonlinearities, the, the source expansion. So this is all summarized in this lambda now. But the point is, um, now we have a system where we can systematically and iteratively compute solutions at a given n in terms of solutions that were already computed earlier. So these solutions. We'll now have, because we know how to invert this operator, um, the solutions will have the, the form if we use um, conditions that the source was stationary in the past. So there was no incoming radiation. Um, then we can write down the retarded green function. For example, for the first order term, um, we'll have some form H alpha beta one, it will be something like minus four G integral G prime, G cube X prime. Um, and then this, uh, yeah. let's keep this T alpha beta, um, T prime X prime. Okay, I don't, also don't know if I need to write it 
down, I think maybe I will just already do the integral, you know, maybe for the retarded green function, then you get, you get just um, your dependence on this um, retarded time, t minus x minus x prime over c, right? I think you are probably even more familiar with this than in gravity. Okay, so this, um, yeah, again, I am saying this depends on the boundary conditions you impose. But here we use kind of the retarded green function. Um, and let's call this integrand i. Because now um, this is sort of the formal solution to these equations. But now we need to look at different um, points. Maybe I should also say, so here, this t prime x prime is um, the source point. So it's just somewhere within this source. Um, and then x and t are field points, which can be either in the, um, also in the source region or can be far away. So this is the field. So let me maybe also write here. T and X. Okay, and now we want to analyze the two different cases. If the field point is very near the source or if it is very far from the source. And so, so this is why I called this integrand I. Um, and let me see if I still have the drawing. Okay, then let me make a different Drawing. So we had the binary system here. And what is usually done in Poisson-Tonian theory is calling this near zone. And then there's some exterior zone, which is outside the source, but not yet so far away. And then at infinity, we have the far away wave zone. And so now we are looking at solutions or expansions of this solution have in the near zone and the exterior. And then later we will discuss what's happening for the waves. So in the near zone, well, these, these points X and X prime, if this point now gets also moved to near the spit or at least near the source somewhere, um, then um, it basically means x and x prime are not too far apart. Forgot this here. Now it's correct. Um, so then these retardation effects are actually quite small. So to a leading approximation um, in the near zone. Retardation effects are small. So we expand this um, quantity i in the near zone, Nz. Nz. Um, so it's approximately then um, lambda. So I'm not, not writing, or, or okay, here we use explicitly t. Um, I'll just drop the indices for now. T x prime, so saying this is almost zero. Um, and then here we, we cannot approximate the denominator. And then plus now a Taylor expansion, T dot of T x prime, again divided by x minus x prime. But now we have to differentiate also the argument here. Okay, maybe it was even a bit too explicit. Um, divided by C plus blah, 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 higher orders once we tailor expand the function around um, X minus X prime going to zero. Okay. And so what we see here is, um, well, first of all, these higher order terms are higher orders in one over C. 
So to a leading approximation, we can neglect them if we work in the near zone and just work with these instantaneous potentials. So this will contribute then at the next order in our approximation. Um, and um, we, we notice potentials are instantaneous. And we also notice now a problem, namely um, the solution, or maybe I need to write down um, um, some higher terms, but the solution actually diverges for large x. Yeah, in the expression for the integrand near sun, your first t, yeah. uh, the argument is x prime, right? Yes, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because, uh, so, okay. Um, that the solution diverges is, if you look at the next term in this series, you will get something quadratic in x minus x prime, and then, um, it will only cancel out one factor here, so it will start to yeah, be proportional to x minus x prime. So as x minus x prime goes to infinity, these higher order terms will take over, and it's no longer a good approximation to have only this term as a leading order approximation. Is it clear, or should I write down the next term? I think, yeah, you, it's probably um, clear. Okay, so this is now what we have identified. The next consideration is how to how do these things scale in the exterior zone? Oh, I just erased it. But okay, the exterior is also pretty descriptive. Um, so that means now we are outside the source and looking at the source um, from a bit larger distances. So it means X is much larger than X prime. So in the exterior zone, Um, the size of the source is small. And then we approximate again this integrand in the exterior zone, let's say EZ, is approximately T of, and now um, we assume X prime is small, then it's like in electromagnetism, you do the same kind of approximation. Um, now it's just proportional to the retarded time in terms of x, um, x prime divided by now just the x magnitude, because we assume x prime is very small compared to x, so we expand this scalar um, plus x prime i by the x prime i. Again, a Taylor series expansion of this T over blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to write down all of these things and then evaluate it at X minus X prime equals just X plus blah, blah, blah. Right? Is it clear? So you expand basically for X prime much smaller than X, a Taylor series. Okay. And so this, I will, I will um, now discuss in a bit more detail because this is actually a multipole expansion. And you might remember this also from electromagnetism where a, simple, a similar um, situation arises, but there's some important notation that we use for gravitational waves that I want to introduce with this method. So for the near zone, uh... The separation between the two particles is also of order x prime, right? Like here, it's like x prime is like the position of the composed source, right? But if you like you want to resolve the detail, like the separation of two masses, it's also of order x prime, right? Or... So, sorry, what do you mean with the x? Well, you're writing a source as two point particles, they are separated. This one. What is the difference? 
Oh, okay. No, yeah, it's not yet um, visible because we haven't plugged in yet what this T is. So, so far we have um, considered the T to just be the stress energy tensor to be any source. Yes. So, so we have not yet said these are two particles of um, two lines at a certain separation or so. Um, so the, the still have generic, just any source, if you look kind of near it, then you're in the near zone. And if you're far from it, then you're in the exterior zone. And if you're very, very far, then you're in the wave zone. So the separation between particles would come in once we plug in what this energy moment attaches. Maybe a little question. So, what are the physical scales that define the three regions? Because you, uh, you understand this yes. mathematically. I mean, it's a, an expansion around x prime equals zero, whatever. But uh, yes. what are there must be physical quantities, right, uh, for this distinction in the three yes. zones? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the wave zone is um, where the you're looking at radii that are much larger than the wavelength of the gravitational waves. Um, maybe I. Don't know. Write it. So let's say at, you look at distances r, and then you have somewhere the um, wavelength lambda of the gravitational waves, and kind of out here you're in the wave zone. And then um, you have, let's say, the size of the source is L. Then, yeah, here you're in the near zone. And then the exterior zone is kind of in between-ish. So maybe at some intermediate um, radius A or so, then we could be in the exterior zone. Because in electromagnetism, you also have, for example, an induction zone near the source where yeah, things behave differently than if you look really farther away. Yes, there are three scales. One is L, one is lambda, and the other one is big R, which is the distance of the observer. Yeah. Um, yes. Something like that. Yes. Okay, you mean now here this we call big R, we can put in here or the field point, let's say. Not the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. It's a bit weird to. Seems like the divergence for large uh, x minus x prime for the near zone, uh, mm -hmm. that's only formal. And if we actually think about how the time derivative of t um, experience, then it's not actually converge because we would that assume that the time derivative with that some terms that scales as one over r, one over x minus x prime. Um. Yeah, yeah, so it, it is kind of, a, yes. Um, so, sorry, what do you mean it's canceled? Because, um, um, so T, um, that would uh, be something like an acceleration and which scales as one over uh, X minus X prime to the square uh, or something. So the time derivatives, I would expect it to add uh, extra inverse powers of X minus X prime. When you actually insert uh, equation of motion solutions for the t's, so doesn't that actually when we insert everything, then um, <coughs> the divergence actually goes away? Large uh, x prime. X minus x prime is not the distance. The distance between you and. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. So let's let's say um, what can we do in the remaining time? So let's learn about these um, notation for multiple expansions because that at least then you can go to the literature on Positronian theory and at least read some references and um, understand the, the notation. Um, and for that. Um, let me yeah, start multiple expansions here. 
And I also can refer you to some um, nice references. So the main seminal paper was one by Kip Thorne, it's called Multiple Expansion of Gravitational Radiation. Um, but keep in mind um, sort of the application. So the formalism there is nicely explained, but the applications are quite limited and they have been superseded by more, um, I mean, because he uh, analyzed linearized gravity. Um, so now the results are, applications are, um, there is newer um, information and there's one which I will get to in a moment. Yeah. Ask a question, maybe I will. Just yeah. a bit of this near the next year's equation. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, the steel zone is not characterized by a scale. It's like this. And uh, so it's so three scales. One magic region. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, let's now again um, recall a Taylor series expansion of a function that depends on, you know, a vector of variables. Let's call it now f of big X. It is, has, has nothing to do with the f we considered in the first lecture. Um, but, uh, um, and we want to expand it around a reference point. Let's call it Z. Okay, and we uh, write down the Taylor expansion. Um, it's, well, to a leading order, it's F of Z plus, now we take Xi minus Zi. Okay. Well, I will use the notation Di just to say if it means D by Dxi um, of F of X. Now evaluated at x equals z. Evaluated at x equals z plus. Um, we also write down the next term. One half x i minus z i x j minus z j squared. Lots of higher order terms. And you can, of course, write it in a um, more compact notation. Sum over some integers, L equals zero to infinity. One over L factorial. It's similar to what you have probably seen before, except we introduce some new notation here. DL of F of X evaluated at X equals Z. So what is this notation? Well, maybe I can still squeeze it down here. Um, so L, big L, denotes a string of L indices. So it could be I, J, K, blah, 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 up to some index A sub L. Um, so, so for example, if we have XL, it means XI, XJ, XK, blah, 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 up to X A sub L. And similarly for the derivatives, DL means DI, DJ, blah, 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 all the way up to the A sub L. Okay, and also this x minus z l means um, shorthand take, take x l minus z l, and then substitute what x l is and what z l is. Okay, all right. Um, so then. Let's also consider an application of this. Suppose, okay, so now um, let's maybe forget about um, this retarded time and so on, and maybe let's just consider the Newtonian gravitational potentials, which is kind of 
equivalent. Um, when Sorry, can I, can I, um, in the case L equals two. Yeah. So um, X two could be uh, X I X J, right? Yes, exactly. And C two could be the I C J. And that difference is not what we have there, right? So, ah, okay. You mean here this? Yes. Yes, yes. I should have written it. Um, so it's L products of uh, those with different labels. Yes. 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 I, I mean, I understand, but. Yes. Yes. So, sorry. This was not good to write it in this way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, X. I minus Z, I, blah, 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 X, L, A, L, minus yes. Z, A, L, yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, um, yes, as I said, so now we consider the Newtonian gravitational potential because if you plug, for example, this term into this integral, you, you see, um, and for, for use for this t zero zero just the mass density, then you see it's four times the Newtonian gravitation minus four times the Newtonian gravitation potential. So it's a bit relevant to consider this um, potential, and we want to now write it in terms of this multipole expansion to see what it looks like in the exterior zone in terms of this notation. Okay, so we take the example Newtonian gravitational potential in the exterior. So let's just say this is defined by e cubed x prime rho of t x prime. And then we have the same equivalence x prime. Okay, and now we say, okay, we, we are um, at points X far outside the source. So we now expand um, this potential. Let's say we also expand around a reference point Z, which could be, for example, the center of mass of the system. And we use this result. So then we can write this as, again, the infinite sum, L equals zero to infinity. Um, and integrate e cubed x prime rho of t x prime. Um, and then comes the sum, one over l factorial that we had here. Um, and then um, x minus z l. And now we, we have to again take l derivatives of x of f which is now our function by dx prime L of um, this one minus over x minus x prime. And evaluated at x prime equals z after taking the derivative. Okay, this is just plugging in the Taylor expansion formula we had, but now um, we notice we can swap derivatives with respect to x prime for derivatives with respect to x. If we account for the fact that if it's odd numbers of derivatives, we pick up a minus sign. And if, it, if it's even numbers, it's um, a plus sign. So let's do this um, and write this as minus one to the L. Yeah. Um, yeah, that means still keep e by the xl now, very important. This is now x, changed to x from x prime. And then again, the same derivative um, of x minus x prime. Um, again, evaluated at x prime equals. But since now um, the derivative is with respect to x, not x prime, we can just plug in z here and neglect this evaluation. Evaluate it now before taking the derivative. 
So let's write it already as Z and omit this. It's rather simplified. Okay, so why is this now useful? Um, well, because now we can separate all the dependence on X prime and the one on this um, variable X. So we, let's write it as G and then we have this integral of d cubed x prime um, of rho. And um, now the only x prime dependence, oops, this was supposed to be x prime because we expand around x prime around the reference point z. Um, so this here we still have as an x prime dependence. So x prime minus z l. And then now comes, okay, yeah, the sum does need to be outside here. Um, L equals zero to infinity. Um, and now we have from, from this term here, now just minus one to the L over L factorial, and then DL of one over X minus Z. Okay. And um, you might, well, maybe not yet, but these are kind of the multiple moments of the source because it's, for example, if you take L equals zero, this just gives you the mass. Um, and then L equals one will give you the dipole and L equals two, the quadrupole. And then here, this does not yet look like a nice multiple expansion, so we want to further simplify it. And I don't know if we can do it today. We, we can maybe yeah get a little bit farther. So our aim is now to simplify this derivative term further. And for that, let's derive some useful relations, or at least I will give you the results and we'll kind of um we'll do a few examples to see why it should be this way. So um Instead of carrying around this x minus v, we because this is just a scalar, we can just call it r for this purpose. And um, so let's simplify it by so let um, x bar i let's say is x i minus v i. Defining a new coordinate and r is square root of delta ij xi xj, where the delta is just the Kronika delta, a three dimensional flat metric in Cartesian coordinates. Okay, um, and then let's consider if we take now, because here we basically have to take L derivatives of this one over. Uh, for that the bars, um, then let's consider just taking one derivative, so d i one over r. Okay, well, it's something you should probably best work out for yourself. I'm not sure if it's useful that I go through the algebra, but okay, we have to make sure for r we use this square root expansion, so um, it will be minus one half one over r cubed because now we have to basically the square root, uh, we bring the, the power down and write it to one power less, which gives again r cubed. And then we have to also differentiate the argument, which is two delta k by x k bar, where k is just some dummy index. Um, because we have to relabel these indices if we differentiate to um, avoid repeated um, terms. So it's minus x bar i over r cubed. And it's nice to write this minus n bar i over r squared, where n bar is a unit vector. So it's x bar over r is a unit vector. Because these unit vectors will play an important role um, later on. So we already want to define them here. 
Um, so it means n dot n is one. So now if we take another derivative, dj di one over r. Okay, maybe I'll leave the algebra to you. Um, similar reasoning implies that we get three over r cubed. And if you write it in terms of n, it's ni nj minus one third delta ij. Okay, and um, so now we can start to see some interesting um, patterns here because this expression is actually symmetric under i and j. Inter interchange and it's also trace free. What does it mean trace free? Um, Okay, let me first say this kind of property we call STF. So symmetric under I and J and trace free, we call symmetric trace free. Um, trace free means um, you set, in, in this particular case, you set I and J equal and see what comes out. So if we have N bar I, N bar I uh, minus one third delta I I. And I should also say, when using these three-dimensional flat space indices, I don't pay attention to if they're up or down, because it doesn't matter. They're raised with the delta ij. So yeah, sometimes you see some inconsistent notation. Um, yeah. So that so then, what is this equal to? Well, n dot n is one by construction, but it's a unit vector, or n bar, um, and. Delta I, I is three, if you remember. Um, so you see it's zero. So it is indeed trace free. And um, because these symmetric trace free tensors play an important role, um, we also use a special notation for, um, for them. But maybe this is something we discuss tomorrow. So we will end here for today and continue.